So, in the previous part, we saw how to do a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, that is a scheme where you can uh, evaluate low degree polynomial on encrypted uh, data. And in this part, I'm going to show you how to transform it into a fully homomorphic scheme where you can evaluate any polynomial on data, any function on data. And the high level idea is going to be in the, in the next two slides, and it's pro and definitely the most beautiful idea in, the, in my talk today, uh, due to a uh, gentleman from last year. So here is where we stand right now. Uh, we can evaluate low degree polynomials. So if somebody gives you a polynomial F, represented, let's say, as an arithmetic circuit, um, you can look at this circuit and come up with this uh, apparatus of this person that works on things without actually touching them so that you can evaluate that function F on uh, encrypted data. So now if you have encrypted bits, X1 through XT, all encrypted inside of their boxes, you can send them into this apparatus and out comes another box that containing the, contains the uh, function F evaluated on these Xs. So things to note about this. First of all, what we need in order to construct this apparatus is a description of the function. We need an arithmetic circuit of polynomial size that computes this polynomial, and this polynomial has to be low degree. The second thing, we can evaluate it on the XIs where they are fresh. The XIs are freshly encrypted ciphertexts. The Y that we get out of it is not inside a green box anymore. Now it's inside an orange box because it has noise level, which is too high. So, yeah. Uh, it's easier to it's easier to talk about low degree polynomials and the decryption procedure that I'm going to show you is not a low degree it's not a, a, a shallow circuit at all. It's actually if you think about the, the, the depth of that circuit, the particular circuit that I'm going to talk about, it's going to be high depth, but uh, it's still going to evaluate low degree polynomial. But it's also also it's easier to count. It's easier to count with the degree than it is to count with depth. But yeah, in particular, if you have shallow circuits, uh, then the degree that, and, and you know, the fan in two circuits, then the degree that they can compute is at most uh, uh, exponential in the depth. So we can evaluate this thing when the XIs are fresh and they have low noise, and the Y that we get still has low enough noise to be decrypted but we cannot evaluate any farther on it because if we try to, the noise will keep growing. We're going to get this red Q of Y and red boxes we cannot open anymore. They have too much noise. When we try to decrypt them, we get the wrong answer. So that's the problem we're facing right now. And here's how to solve it. We're going to use bootstrapping. And the idea of bootstrapping is the following. Take a ciphertext, fix that ciphertext, and now look at the decryption procedure as a function that takes a secret key as input and produces the unencrypted bit as output. Well, it would only produce the right, the right answer with the correct secret key, but it's still a well-defined function nonetheless. Right? For every secret key, you can use that secret key to try to decrypt this particular ciphertext, and you're going to get something out. In particular, in our scheme, the secret key is a number p, so for any number p, you can compute c mod p mod 2, and you're going to get a bit. So this is a well-defined function. Now, you can ask yourself, this function, if I try to build an a, a, a Boolean circuit, arithmetic circuit mod 2, a Boolean circuit that uh, compute that function, what would be the degree of that function as a polynomial? And you can hope that it's a, it's a low-degree polynomial. Now let's say that we were lucky and our crypto system was such that the decryption procedure can be expressed as a low degree polynomial. So the first thing to note, well, if decryption itself is low degree polynomial, 
then so are these two functions, the decrypted addition and decrypted multiplication. You take two ciphertexts now, and your function takes as input the secret key. The two ciphertexts are, are fixed. You take as input the secret key, you decrypt one, you decrypt the other, you add the result mod two. Again, well-defined function takes a secret key as input, produces a bit as output. If the decryption procedure for the first ciphertext is, is a low degree and the decryption procedure for the second ciphertext is also a low degree, then the sum of them is a polynomial of degree at most, the max between these two functions. And for the product, the degree is going to be the sum of the two degrees. So if you have degree five for decryption, then um, decrypt and multiply will have degree 10. So if you so lucky so as to have a crypto system with low degree decryption, then you can think of these two functions and they also will have low degree. So let's suppose that we had these functions, these uh, crypto systems. Here is what we do. Um, this slide is the nice idea. So. Uh, um, First, we're gonna include in the public key also an encryption of the secret key itself. Now, for that, you need the crypto system to remain secure in the face of adding this thing to the public key. By the way, I switched from secret key to, in the previous part to public key in this part. Uh, you can make all of these, uh, arg you can present all of these arguments as arguments on secret key encryption. It's just nicer this way. Um, so you include in the public key also a, an encryption of the secret key, and you hope that your crypto system remains secure. And if it, is, remains, if it, it does remain secure this way, then it, then it is called a circularly secure encryption scheme. So let's hope that our scheme not only had uh, low degree decryption, it's also circular secure. Uh, and now we have this fresh encryption of the secret key bits added to our public key. And now we have two ciphertexts. Both are orange ciphertexts. We cannot evaluate on them anymore without uh, having the noise grow too much. What we can do, however, is just based on the ciphertext themselves, or well, the ciphertext bits we know in the clear. So we can write down an arithmetic circuit that computes the function m sub c1 c2. Remember, this is the function that takes as input the secret key bits Decrypt C1, decrypt C2, and multiply it. We can write the decryption as an uh, arithmetic circuit, Boolean circuit. Uh, so we can put two of them, one next to the other, one of them decrypting C1, the other one decrypting C2. Um, and then add a multiplication gate at the top. So we have an explicit decryption description of the function which decrypt and multiply. Now we're in the setting where we have freshly encrypted bits and a function that we want to evaluate on these bits. So we just evaluate. And we get another orange ciphertext, evaluated ciphertext. The thing encrypted in it is the function mc1c2 applied to the secret key bits. Now if you open what the description of that, what the definition of that function is, that is what you get if you decrypt C1, decrypt C2, and multiply the result, which is exactly X1 times X2, the thing that you wanted. So we wanted an, uh, a ciphertext, an evaluated ciphertext, but we wanted a ciphertext that A can be decrypted and B include in it the bit X1 times X2. So instead of evaluating uh, this thing on this orange ciphertext, we just generate from this orange ciphertext a description of a particular function, which we hope is low degree. And if it is low degree, then we can use the fresh ciphertext, the fresh encryptions of the secret key in order to uh, evaluate this function on fresh encryptions. Um, and now we have an encryption of the product, and we never needed to work on uh, evaluated ciphertext. Every time we need to do another operation, we keep going back to the fresh encryption of the secret key generate one of these functions and evaluate it. Uh, so that's essentially the entire bootstrapping idea, and this is uh, a slightly more precise statement of that idea. So fix 
one particular scheme. It has a generation, encryption, decryption, and a validation procedure. Um, and look at any particular class of function f. So this is a class of, fun of uh, functions with relative to a particular representation of a function or whatever. Uh, this is something that the crypto system can evaluate. In this, uh, by, by, what I mean by that is that just it is possible to apply the evaluation procedure on it. I don't say whether it works or not, whether you get the right decryption or not, but it is possible to apply, syntactically possible to apply the evaluation procedure. And now look at all the evaluated ciphertext that you can possibly get using functions from that, that class. So take any function in this class and take any encryptions of zeros and one and apply the evaluation procedure. That gives you a ciphertext. Look at all the possible ciphertext that you can get that way. This is the class that I'm representing as C sub F orange because it's all the evaluation ciphertexts that correspond to, fun to functions in the class F. Okay? So we call a, a scheme bootstrappable, a scheme for which it is possible to apply the previous trick, uh, if there exists a class of function F for which two things happen. First, if you take any of these ciphertext C sub F and apply the eval to it, what you get is the right answer. So for any encryptions, um, for any encryptions of bits and for any function F, if you evaluate F on those encryptions and then decrypt, what you get is really F applied to the, to the bits. So the evaluation procedure works for all the evaluated ciphertext in C sub F. Uh, and moreover, for any two ciphertext in C sub F, um, both the addition, the crypted addition, and the crypted multiplication also happens to be in the class F. So I'm defining C sub F with respect to F, and then I can ask whether these two functions are in F or not. So I need the function where A, the eval works for it, and B, when you define C sub F and then look at these two functions, you, you, it, this class of function F is closed under that uh, operation. Yeah. yeah or, like or, no, actually what would happen is that I'm going to have to look at ciphertext. Well, you we talk, we talk about evaluated ciphertext. So you're going to have to assume that your ciphertext has some extra properties other than being decryptable in order for this procedure to work. So my C sub F would essentially be uh, all these ciphertexts. They, 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 more specifically, I'm going to need ciphertext with slightly lower noise than what you otherwise could think are possible, is possible to handle. So you can think of this as, a, as an operation on F. You start from F, you go to C sub F, and then you look at all these, these functions, and F has to be closed under this transformation of looking at ciphertext and looking at the functions that they define. And then the theorem that I had proved pictorially on the previous slide is that if you have uh, an encryption scheme which is A, circular secure, and B, bootstrappable, so a function that satisfies this uh, definition and, in addition, is secure even if you put the encryption of the secret key in the, uh, the published encryptions of the secret key, then this function is homomorphic for any, f this crypto system is homomorphic for any function. You can use it to evaluate any function. Well, what I showed you is you can use it to evaluate addition and multiplications but you can express any function, any Boolean function, uh, as a polynomial, and if you can evaluate any polynomial, you can evaluate any function. So that's Gentry's theorem, uh, and I'm not gonna sh show the, I'm gonna say anything about, uh, more about this theorem. I think that the proof is obvious just by watching the, the animation. So I'm not gonna try to prove it based on uh, that definition. But, um, I'm going to stop and, and, and let everybody appreciate the beauty of this uh, idea, and then I'm going to move on. Um, which brings just the, the little question is whether we have any functions, any, any encryption schemes that are good candidates for application of this theorem, right? We need an a, a encryption scheme which is bootstrappable and, and circularly secure. 
So, you know, you can take any bit by bit encryption scheme and assume that it's circularly secure because we have no clue how to break a crypto system once you publish encryption of the secret key uh, if the crypto system is bit by bit. We have, after quite a few years of effort, last, couple, last year or two, or two, people started coming up with examples of crypto systems that are semantically secure but not circular secure. So it was very hard to come up with these examples and they rely heavily on the fact that the secret key, uh, you get the, whole, the entire secret key as a block and you can work on it. If the encryption scheme only gets a single bit, it doesn't know if this bit came from the secret key or not, it has to encrypt it. And then you take all these ciphertexts and put them somewhere and, and let somebody look at them. It's very, very hard to even think of a way that that could possibly help you break the crypto system. So, so far from what we know today, we don't know that the following conjecture is false. Uh, <laughs> the conjecture is that every semantically secure crypto system is also circularly secure. So these schemes that have been proposed weren't somewhat homomorphic? So the, so the schemes that I proposed so far, oh, the, no, those, no, 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 they're not. The scheme that I proposed so far, you can prove that it's semantically secure based on the assumption that approximate GCD is hard. And if you believe this conjecture that every semantically secure bit by bit encryption is also circularly secure, then you get for free that it's also circularly secure. That's the beauty of crypto, you can make assumptions. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, leaving that alone, let's see. So let's, let's hope that it is circular secure and let's see if it's bootstrappable. So for that, we need to ask ourselves what is the degree of the decryption polynomial? So let's see well, how do you decrypt? Your ciphertext is C, your secret key is P. Uh, what you do is you take the least significant bit of the ciphertext and you XOR to it the least significant bit of the rounded number C over P. You divide C by P, you round it to, an, to the nearest integer, and then you take the least significant bit of that. So that's the only operation here that's not trivial. Well, there's taking the least significant bit doesn't cost you anything because C is in the clear. Uh, taking an XOR is, is, doesn't add anything to the degree. So the only thing that's, um, uh, that costs something in terms of a high degree polynomial would be divide two integers one by the other and then round it to the nearest integer. So let's think how would you do that? Well, if you just try to remember how to divide numbers, you write them like this, one on top of the other, and you write it down. That takes degree which is at least uh, I guess the, the, bit, the bit size of C or something, n to the fifth. And I was, I was trying to think whether you can make, get it down to n square, which is the size of P, and I wasn't sure about it. Maybe there is a way to do it. But we needed n, right? The setting of our parameters has P has n square bits, and the degree that we can support is n. There's no way you can take that operation uh, and write it as an n degree polynomial. I don't know, by the way, I don't know how to prove that last statement that I just said. I think it's true. Maybe people have proven it, but I don't know how to prove it, that this function cannot be expressed as a polynomial of degree n. Uh, I think over the binary field it is possible to prove it, but you have the freedom. I didn't, I didn't talk about it. I talked only about operations mod 2. You can do the same thing with operations mod 7 if you want. Uh, and I'm not sure how to prove it for any, or modulo any uh, integer. But in any case, we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to write this operation as a low degree polynomial. Um, and if you want to apply the bootstrapping techniques, you actually need to be able to describe the decryption scheme explicitly as a low degree polynomial, which we don't know how to do. So this scheme is not bootstrappable. Um, and so we need to do something to squash the decryption circuit. Well, the, this expression sort of assumes that we're looking for, um, for um, low depth circuits. We're not, we're looking for low degree polynomials. So we need to uh, some way to reduce the degree of the decryption polynomial. And the schemes that I'm going to describe are essentially the same as the scheme that, the, uh, the technique that Gentry was using to reduce the degree of his somewhat homomorphic encryption. Uh, Gentry proposed a different somewhat homomorphic encryption based on ideal lattices. Uh, somewhat harder to explain how it works, but it ran into exactly the same type of problems that it can evaluate 
low degree polynomials, but doesn't, the, the decryption procedure is not low degree enough, so we need a way to make it lower and use the techniques that are essentially the same as the ones that I'm going to show. So first of all, in general, how can you possibly take a decryption procedure that's high degree and imagine making it lower degree? So, well, you can look for another crypto system, but that's hard. We already spent all that effort on, on building this one. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to do some more operations in the public domain. Add stuff to the public key and do some operations on clear text bits that we have before we start using the secret key for decryption. And let's hope that some of these operations, we do a lot of more work um, based on the public key and the ciphertext and hope that this helps us do the decryption with less work. Uh, in particular, in order to help that, we're actually going to add some more stuff to the public key. All kind of hints about the secret key. We're going to publish all kind of functions, maybe randomized functions of our secret key, add them to the public key, hope that this crypto system still remains secure. And now, since there are more stuff in the public key, then there are things that you can do with your ciphertext to post-process them and then decryption would be simpler. This idea in, in this form was used in what's called server-aided cryptography. The setting there is I have my weak device with the secret key and I need to decrypt, but my device is so weak, I don't know, RFID or, or what have you, that it's really hard for it to decrypt. So I want the server to help me, but I don't want to give them my key to the server. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get some, compute some hints about my secret key, give those hints to the server, the server will get the original ciphertext, post-process it, and give me the post-processed ciphertext, and then it's easier to decrypt. So it was used for RSA, uh, crypto system, where you give things to the server that doesn't allow the server to decrypt by himself, but allows the server to post-process the ciphertext and make it easier to decrypt. Uh, so I'm going to, we're going to use it, uh, similar things. Here's a pictorial uh, description. So this is our original circuit. Uh, it takes the secret key and, and the ciphertext and produces the plain text. Uh, the new system, I'm going to add to the public key some function of the secret key, maybe a randomized function of the secret key. Uh, and given that additional hint, Anybody can take the ciphertext and post-process it, resulting in a post-processed ciphertext. I might want to also change the format of my secret key because now I need to do a different operation and hopefully this different operation uh, is gonna be cheaper than the thing I started from. That's, uh, that's basically uh, server-aided cryptography for you. Shai? Yep. You can, if, if, if you wanted to do, before the post-processing, you do a little bit of operation. So the, the, the interaction with the server would be uh, interactive. I don't Is think so. Well? Um, as long as everything overall would be low degree? I don't know. Actually, it's, it's an interesting thing, I thought. I don't know. I don't know. It, if you maintain state from one to the other, it might be a problem. If you don't maintain state, then it's probably okay. Well... Um, so here is what we're going to do, the particular way that we're going to uh, transform our scheme. So the old secret key was the integer p, and the function of the secret key that we're going to add to the public key is this. We're going to add many real numbers, by that I mean rational numbers represented with high enough precision. Uh, we're going to add many um, rational numbers like that to the, to the public key. All of these numbers are between 0 and 2. 
which means that uh, they have one bit to the left of the binary point and then many bits potentially to the right of the binary point. Um, the precision that we're going to need, if, if, I, if I remember or comment on the precision uh, in the point in the, of, of the proof where it matters, uh, but roughly we need as much precision as the size of our, our, our ciphertexts. Our ciphertexts are roughly n to the fifth bit uh, long, so we need them with about n to the fifth bits, uh, bits of precision. Um, but the property of these integers are going to be random, subject to the constraint that there exists a very, very sparse subset of them that adds up to 1 over p with the required precision. So there is a very, very short uh, subset of those that whose uh, sum, when you compute it over the integer, is 1 over p, where we ignore the, the top bits. The top bits can, uh, we just reduce everything mod p, so a uh, mod 2. So reducing a rational number mod 2, meaning don't care about anything other than the first bit to the left of the binary point. So add them, and then throw away all the top bits. So now, one thing to notice, if you have many of these numbers, if you have roughly the same um, number of rational numbers as their precision, then definitely, or a little more than that, then definitely you expect there to exist a subset um, that adds up to 1 over p. So basically, you know, the number of subsets is 2 to the power of the number of numbers that you have there, the number of bits of precision is whatever it is, so as long as the number of subsets is sufficiently larger than the number of numbers that you can generate, then you expect every number to appear. <coughs> Just, uh, um, and you can pr even prove that that happens with some pro good probability. But these subsets are not sparse, and it's going to be very important in our case that there exists a sparse subset. And the other thing to say is that this adds a computational assumption because uh, there is no way to put, uh, if you put a polynomially many numbers like this in the public key, then there will not exist a sparse enough subset of, of all but negligible probability. The probability that there exists a sparse enough subset would be negligible. So you actually are adding information, real information to the public key, which means that now your security is going to rely on, on extra computational assumptions. I'll talk about that at the very end. But for now, this is what we do. We add a whole bunch of numbers to the public key, um, and there is, exists a very sparse subset of them that adds up to 1 over p, <coughs> mod 2, when you disregard the high bits. Uh, and our post-processing procedure would be uh, take your ciphertext C, the one that you want to decrypt, and just multiply it by all of these numbers. Okay? The new ciphertext is C star, which is the original C, and all the psi i's. Psi i's is obtained by multiplying your ciphertext C by each one of these d i's. You, as the person doing the post-processing don't know whether this particular di belongs to the subset or doesn't belong to the subset. So you're just going to multiply by them all and add, and now you have a big giant ciphertext, uh, extended ciphertext like that. I'm going to change the format of my secret key. The secret key, instead of being p itself, is going to be the characteristic vector of my sparse subset. So I have many bits in the secret key, one for every integer that I put in the public key, and the bit is a zero if that integer belongs to the sparse subset, and the bit is a one if that integer doesn't belong to the sparse subset. Uh, and now notice that c over p, which is c times one over p, uh, is c times the sum of sigma i di, which if you uh, bring c inside the, the summation, is just the sum of sigma i times psi i. So my decryption procedure that before that was division, now it's just a subset sum. So my decryption procedure is I take all of these psi i, multiply each psi i by the corresponding new secret key bit sigma i, and add them all together, okay? So this is, this is c over p. Now I need to round it, and etc. 
but uh, just computing C over P now is all of a sudden a linear operation in the sigma i's. And the fact that it's sparse is the thing that's gonna save, that's gonna save me and give me the low degree that I need at the very end. Uh, so here is our decryption, new decryption procedure. The decryption procedure take the extended, the post-process ciphertext C, and now the least significant bit of the original C minus the rounded C over P. C over P is the summation of sigma i, psi i. I take all of that mod 2. This is my new decryption procedure. And now the rest, almost until the end of the, um, of the one hour that I, I still have, uh, would be spent on trying to figure out how to make this expression low degree polynomial. What? No, because you have, you, you no, you, ha you have the, the number of, of, let's say that, that I have uh, polynomially many, uh, well, let's say that T is polynomial, let's say that T is N to the 7, and my sparse subset is of size N. So I have N choose to the 7 choose N if I just wanted to uh, use brute force. So let me write down a little more explicit. I'm, I'm going to get to extremely low level details about how to add numbers. So anybody here that doesn't remember how the uh, grade school addition algorithm works, by the end of this talk, I promise you will remember it very well. Um, so here is how you add numbers. You just write them one under the other and then you add, right? So here, um, this is, this is, these are our numbers. They are all numbers between 0 and 2, right? We don't care about bits to the um, uh, higher up left to the binary point. This is our binary point. This is the first bit to the left of the binary point. I'm going to call this bit 0, and then the, the bits here I'm going to call minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. What I need to do is take these numbers, multiply each number by the corresponding sigma i. The sigma i's are bits. Uh, and then add it up, and this is what I want. The, the number that I'm going to get at the end uh, is the rounded, th this bit is the rounded thing. Actually, well, through the re throughout the rest of the talk, I'm looking at this bit as if this was the bit that I want to compute. If I want to round it to the nearest integer, then really I need to look at whether this bit is 1 or 0, and if it is 1, then I need to round up, and otherwise I need to round down. Forget about all of that. That's, uh, first of all, it's not going to matter, and the second thing is, um, oh, it's also not going to matter. Um, I, can ma I can map everything. You know, at, at the end of this thing, I can always add a half to everything and then just do floor. So if you want, you add another number here, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Add this one also to the mix, and then at the end, round down. And now you really were computing this bit. So, OK? That's why, one reason why it doesn't matter. Um, so this is what I want. Uh, moreover, what is it? What is the number which is uh, psi 1 times sigma 1? Well, sigma 1 is either 0 or 1. If sigma 1 is 0, then psi i times sigma 1 is 0. If sigma 1 is 1, then psi, I times, uh, psi 1 times sigma 1 is just psi 1. So each one of these numbers is either the number that's written here or, sigma, or, or, uh, or 0. How do I get the binary representation of this number that I want from the binary representation of psi 1? Here's an example. How do I get the binary representation of 1, 1, blah, blah, 0, 1, times psi 1 from the binary representation of this. I just take all the 1s and put sigma 1 instead. Right? So if you think now as in our application, that in application the case would be that we have all these psi i's in the clear. This is, what, this is our post-processed ciphertext. The sigmas we have encrypted. So we want the binary representation of psi i times sigma i. What we do is take the encryption of sigma i and just put it 
in every place where psi i has a one. In a place where psi i has a zero, we can keep a zero, we can put an encryption of zero, it doesn't really matter. Um, in, in our crypto system in particular, zero happens to be an encryption of zero, so we might, might as well keep it there. Um, so this is what we want now. What we want now is we have these numbers. We took the psi i's, we put in the, the place of the ones, we put the sigma i's. Now we want to add these numbers. These are explicit numbers that we have, even though in the application there are actually encrypted numbers that we have. We have the encryption of the binary representation of those numbers. And we want to add, add them. So how do we add numbers? Well, there are actually more than one way to add numbers, and there is a reason to use one algorithm rather than the other. In this talk, we're using grade school addition. Uh, to compute it, and there are actually, grade school addition gives you the lowest possible degree that you can hope to get. Other methods might give you slightly higher degree with easier to, with faster procedure to compute them. So I'm gonna describe to you an algorithm. It can be, this algorithm can be represented as an arithmetic circuit. Uh, and this arithmetic circuit can be homomorphically evaluated, and I'm gonna eventually show that the degree of this thing is low. But we're gonna use the, the grade school uh, algorithm, uh, addition algorithm, and just in case anybody have forgotten, here is how you use grade school addition to add numbers. Um, so again, this is our decryption procedure up here. Uh, we took the less significant bit of C and we add to it the least significant bit of this summation. And this, this blue box here is that summation. So the AIJs are the bits of sigma i times psi i. These are the bits that we saw before when you replace ones of psi i with sigmas. Um, the AIJ are the binary representation um, of the psi i's. Each AIJ is either sigma i or it's zero. And what we want is use grade school addition and we ask what is the degree of B as a polynomial in the AIJs? This is, what, this is the question we want answered and we need it to be low. So let's go and see. Uh, here is how you use grade school addition to add numbers. You start from the rightmost column uh, and at least when I was in grade school, they teach us that the, the, first di the first digit you write underneath because it's part of the result, and all the other digits you write at the top because they're carry bits. I'm not sure that's universal, but uh, this is what I know, so I'll stick to it. Um, and so now you have, uh, you, you're done processing the first uh, column and you can move on. What we're adding are binary numbers. So we do everything in binary. So what is the addition of all these bits? This is just the humming weight of that vector. Right? I'm adding bits, I'm counting how many ones are there. Uh, so this thing is just the binary representation of the humming weight of the first column. Right? The least significant bit of the humming weight is just the addition of all of these mod two. The next bit is the two's position in that number, and then the four's position in that number. So the entire carry, what it is, is just the humming weight of this column represented in binary. And we're ignoring the high order bit, so that's modulo two to the p plus one. Uh, and now we can move on. Now we have the, the second column, which consists of the AIJs that we have from before and the carry bit from the previous step. And again, we compute the humming weight modulo two to the p this, one, uh, this time, and express it in binary and write the binary representation like that. And on and on and on until we get to the last column. And now we have all of the AIJs and all of the carry bits that we accumulated. Uh, and now we're looking at the humming weight of this, uh, of this column, modulo four, because we only have the result bit and, and one carry bit that we care about. Uh, and then at the end, well, the, the only thing we care about is this, this bit B. So what we ask is, what is the degree of B? Well, the degree of B, B is just the sum modulo two of all of these bits. So the degree of B will be the highest among the degree of all the carry bits that we accumulated there. So the only thing we need right now is a way to express the carry bits as polynomials in 
these numbers and ask ourselves what is the degree of these polynomials. And the carry bits are having weights of, of these uh, columns. So this is where we are. The next thing that we want is to be able to argue about the degree of the binary representation of the humming weight as a polynomial in the bits that we are taking humming weight off. So let's take a small detour for a few slides and talk about specific polynomials which are of interest in this case, and these are called the elementary symmetric polynomials. So think of a fixed binary vector x with u bits in it, uh, and the degree k elementary symmetric polynomial denoted E sub k of x, is just take all the product of k bits out of the bits of, of x and then add all of these terms. So each term in the symmetric, uh, elementary symmetric polynomial is one collection of k out of the u bits of x. You multiply the, all of these bits, this is one term. You take all of these terms, add them up, this is the elementary symmetric polynomial. You have exactly, you choose k terms in this elementary symmetric polynomial because you choose k out of the u bits of x. And each term is of degree exactly k. So you add, you choose k terms, uh, each one of degree k. So this is a polynomial of degree k. It has exponential in many terms. So if you want to compute it, you're not going to compute it by just uh, doing, uh, going over all the terms. Luckily, there is an efficient way of computing this polynomial. Why do I need an efficient way? Because I need an explicit representation of the addition, uh, of the addition as an arithmetic circuit. So in particular, I'm going, if I'm using grade school addition, I'm going to need to explicitly represent the carry bits. I'm going to show you that the carry bits are, uh, uh, can be computed using the elementary symmetric polynomial, so I need an explicit way of representing, of uh, explicit arithmetic circuit of polynomial size that computes elementary symmetric polynomials. So you can do use dynamic programming to do that. The observation is if you look at the ith symmet elementary symmetric polynomial in the first j bits of x, then there are two types of terms there. The, the terms that include x sub j and the terms that don't include x sub j. The terms that include x sub j are x sub j times terms that include at most i minus one, exactly i minus one uh, bits, and all of these i minus 1 bits are between 1 and i minus 1. So it's the i minus 1 elementary symmetric polynomial in the first j minus 1 bits of x. And the terms that don't include um, x sub j are just the ith elementary symmetric polynomial in the first j minus 1 bits, because they're terms of size i over the first j minus 1 bits. So you have a dynamic programming type of way. The, by convention, e0 of everything is, is always 1. and E i of the empty string is almost always zero, other than this one. Uh, so once you have these conventions, you just compute this uh, this table row by row, and each entry in the table you can is just the sum of the two entries above it, above it to it. So this is an efficient polynomial of computing the kth elementary symmetric polynomial uh, of a vector with u bits. And why do I talk about the elementary symmetric polynomial? Because of the following theorem. Um, cute theorem. Tells you that for every bit of vectors, the ith bit of the humming weight, if you take the humming weight of this vector and write it in binary, the ith bit of the binary would be exactly the two to the ith elementary symmetric polynomial of x modulo two. So the elementary, elementary symmetric polynomials give you a number, right? I mean, you can compute it over whatever structure you want, but it's a number. If you take that number mod two, uh, you get exactly the ith uh, bit of the humming weight of that vector. Um, now, given how simple the statement is, you'd think there'd be a trivial proof of that theorem, and I don't know of a trivial proof of this, th this theorem. This is the simplest proof that I'm aware of. It takes two slides. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, that's life, I don't know. I mean, if anybody knows of a simple uh, proof of that uh, statement, I'll be happy to hear. Um, so the first observation is that the... What is it? Yeah. The two to the i's elementary symmetric polynomial of x is exactly equal as a number. The two to the i's elementary symmetric polynomial, when you compute it over the integer, it's exactly equal 
to the humming weight choose to, to the i. Why is that? Because you take all the 2 to the i-th product of bits from x. Well, if any one of these bits happen to fall among the zero bits of x, then this term is zero and doesn't contribute on anything. The only terms that contribute are terms where all of the bits that you took happen to be one bit, one bits of x, and a term like that would contribute one. So how many of these terms do you have? Well, you choose 2 to the i out of the one bits of, of x, which is exactly the Hamming weight. So this thing, which is that thing, uh, is exactly w choose 2 to the i. So it is enough to show, and this is what I'm going to prove now, is that for any number w, the i bit in the binary representation of w is exactly equal to w choose 2 to the i modulo 2. So that bit is a 1 if w choose 2 to the i is, if, is, is odd, and otherwise it's uh, so this is what I'm going to prove, the, the blue statement here. Um, and let's fix a few more notations. Uh, let's say that the top bit of W, so W now is a number. I don't care about X anymore, it's just a number, and I want to claim that the ith bit in the binary representation of that number is W choose 2 to the i mod 2. Um, and let's say that the top bit of W is K, so W is at least 2 to the K because the Kth bit is on, and it's less than 2 to the K plus 1 because everything to the left is 0. Um, and let's look at W prime, which is the same thing if you turn off the most significant bit. So W minus 2 to the K. It's also a positive, uh, at least non-negative number. Um, and what I'm going to prove to you is that for any bit position up to k, bit position i, if i is smaller than k, then w choose 2 to the i and w prime choose 2 to the i is the same thing, mod 2. And if i equals to k, if we're talking about the kth position, then w choose 2 to the k and w prime choose 2 to the k differ by that plus 1. And if I prove that, then I'm done, because by induction over the size of w, if it's true that the if bit of w prime is exactly w prime choose 2 to the i mod 2, then all the bits up to the kth position are the same in w and w prime. The only thing I did to switch from one to the other is turn off the, la the, the most significant bit. So if it's true that, it's that the, um, the top bit of w prime is, the i bit of w prime is w prime choose 2 to the i mod 2, then the ith bit of w is w prime choose 2 to the i mod 2, which is the same as w choose 2 to the i mod 2. So, um, right, so more formally, I do it by induction. The claim clearly holds for w equals 0. And by the above, if it holds for w prime, then it also holds for w. Uh, I mean, Okay, so we're trying to prove that uh, we're, we're trying to prove the, the blue statement. We got to the point where all I need to prove is these two things: that um, if you look at W and W prime, then um, W choose two to the i and W prime choose two to the i are the same if i is smaller than k and different if i equal to k. So now I'm going to prove that. And to prove that, I'm going to use the following identity. And it looks complicated, but it's not. What it says is the following. Suppose I want to choose some number r out of w. Um, so suppose I, I want to choose 7 out of w. So some number of these 7 would fall on the first 2 to the k bins in w. OK, let's talk about w balls. OK, that would make it. A more concrete. Suppose I have W balls and I want to choose R of them. So some number of these R would fall in the first two to the K balls, and the, the rest of, of the R balls that I'm choosing are going to be from the last two to the K balls. 
right? There's the first W minus 2 to the k balls, the last 2 to the k balls. Some number I'm going to choose out of the first, and the rest I'm going to choose out of the rest. How many ways I have to do it? Well, if I'm choosing j from the first uh, balls, then it's this thing, choose j, and 2 to the i minus j is 2 to the k, and I need to go over j equals 0 to 2 to the t, because like, I have the, the freedom of how many I want to choose out of the first, and how many I want to choose from the rest. So that's the identity. And now I'm going to claim the following. If r is equal to 0, or r is equal to 2 to the k, I'm going to call this guy r here. If r is equal to 0, or r is equal to 2 to the k, then 2 to the k choose r is 1. Well, that's clearly, that's the definition of, of the choose function. Uh, but for any other r, which is bigger than 0 but smaller than 2 to the k, 2 to the k choose r is even is an even number. Um, why is that? Well, let's look at how do you express 2 to the k choose r. So it's, this is the numerator and that's the denominator. And I'm going to look at the right side, everything except this, these two terms. Uh, and I'm going to claim that this has to be an integer. Why is it an integer? Because it's 2 to the k minus 1 choose r minus 1. So it is an integer. In particular, it means that the number of powers of 2 in this product is at least as large as the number of powers of 2 in the product at the bottom. And for this one, well, I know that r is bigger than 0 and smaller than 2 to the k. So the number of powers of 2 in 2 to the k is k, and the number of powers of 2 in r is smaller than k. So all in all, I have more powers of 2 in the numerator than in the denominator. I know that it's an integer because it's this integer. So it has to be an even integer. OK? Not the cleanest proof in the world. Somehow I sort of hoped it would be a simple argument to tell me that. Um, I don't know. Anyway, let's roll back what we did. We proved the fact that, oh, and now, sorry, I need to get to the QED still. Uh, if i is smaller than k, remember we're talking about w choose 2 to the i versus w prime uh, choose 2 to the i. If i is smaller than k, then the only non-zero term, the only term that is not 0 mod 2, would be the term equals to j equals 2 to the i. Because for j equals 2 to the i, this I'm going to get 2 to the k choose 0. And for everything else, I'm going to get 2 to the k choose something bigger than 0 and smaller than 2 to the k. So the only non-zero term is the term corresponding to j equals 2 to the i, which is exactly w minus 2 to the k choose 2 to the i. This is what I wanted to show. For every i smaller than k, w choose 2 to the i uh, is the same as w minus 2 to the k choose 2 to the i. And if i equals to k, then now I have two non-zero terms, one corresponding to j equals 0 which is 2 to the k choose 0 here, and the other corresponding to uh, j equals 2 to the k, which is 2 to the k choose 2 to the k. Each one of those is 1. So I get w minus 2 to the k choose 2 to the i plus 1. So I've just proven that uh, for sm i smaller than k, w choose 2 to the i, and w minus 2 to the k choose 2 to the i are the same. And for i equals k, they're different, which is what I needed to prove. Uh, that proves uh, these lines, and these lines prove the blue line, and that proves the green line, which is what I wanted. So QED, I've proven that the ith bit of the humming weight of any number of the ith bit of the humming weight of any vector is exactly the 2 to the i-th elementary symmetric polynomial on that vector mod 2. Just a fun fact to know about, I guess. Um, OK, let's go back. Remember grade school addition. We're adding the first uh, column, putting the carry bit here, the carry bits here, adding the second column, putting the carry bits there. The goal is to compute the degree of the polynomial of B as a polynomial in the AIJs. <coughs> so let's see. Now we know much more. We can say what, what is it that we're doing when we're doing the steps of the grade school addition. 
<clears throat> so let's look at the rightmost column uh, and look at the carry bits that it sends all to the other columns. So the first carry bit, which is the second bit of the, of the humming rate, uh, is the second elementary symmetric polynomial. Then the third elementary symmetric, this is bit number zero here. Bit number one is here, so it's second symmetric. Bit number two is here, the E4 and E8, etc. So what would be the degree, let's say, of this carry bit? E4 of, uh, of this column. It's actually four. I mean, it's a polynomial of degree four. Its degree is therefore four. Um, uh, okay. But now the, the next question is going to be a little a little harder. Okay. Now now we'll keep doing that. So again, we're computing the second elementary symmetric polynomial over this uh, column. However, the bits in this columns, one of them is actually a degree two polynomial in the bits that we care about. So when we multiply, if, if, our, if our polynomial tells us to multiply this bit by something else, we're going to get degree higher. So let's see, what would be the degree of this carry bit? Uh, this E2. Yeah. Uh, what would be the degree of the carry bit that the second column sends to the third column? Mm -hmm. It's 3. Why? Because we multiply all the pairs out of this column. So the pairs we multiply to degree one polynomials will give us degree two. But the pair when we take the single degree two polynomial and multiply it by one of the degree one polynomials will give us degree three. And similar, the degree of this thing would be five because we take all the four tuples out of them. So the four tuples that include this one and three others from here would give us degree five and the green nine. So in this case, instead of uh, two, four, and eight, we got three, five, and nine. But then when you keep doing that, things get a little more complicated. So just uh, to show that, what would be the degree of this thing here? Seven. Seven, right. So the degree of this is seven, and the other one is a nine, because I took the three, the four, and two of the ones. Uh, so the, the highest degree that I can get is a 9, and I keep doing that. Now I need the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree 2. So this is 15 because I took the 5 and the 7. And all in all, if you look at this column and see what is the highest degree that you get, the highest degree that you get is 16, and you got it from the carry bit that traveled all the way from the, uh, from the rightmost column. And that you can actually prove by induction over... Uh, um, <clears throat> in general, so if you work with precision p, <clears throat> excuse me, if you work with precision p, then the highest degree that you can possibly get is two to the p, and actually, if the number of numbers here is smaller than two to the p, then actually the highest degree that you can get is two to the p minus one. So you can actually even save one on degree, but I don't care about that. So we, we care deeply about the degree of the, of the polynomials, but adding one doesn't matter. Until you need to, uh, to implement it, at which point adding one doesn't matter. But um, OK. <clears throat> so going back to our decryption algorithm, remember the hardest thing was to add these numbers and round them up. I convinced you that the thing that you need to compute is this bit. And now we know that the degree of this bit is 2 to the p, where you walk with precision p. And we can handle degrees up to n. So if we want to get anywhere with this approach, we need to find a way to work with low precision numbers. So far, when I described this thing, I presented everything as working with precision as high as the number of bits in my ciphertext. That won't do. I need much, much lower degree. In particular, I need degree roughly log n. So the next task that I have now is to find a way to work with low precision numbers. And I'm going to claim that actually that's not hard. Uh, I just need to tweak my parameters a little bit, and it comes out for free. Um, well, it takes a proof of one slide, but other than that. 
Um, <clears throat> so the current parameters, we can decrypt as long as the noise is smaller than P over two. So we said that we can get that, and let's suppose that we want polynomials of degree two N. So I prom at some point in the pre first part, I promised to have more concrete parameters. So here is the more concrete parameters. Uh, I want the degree two N polynomials uh, with at most two to the N square terms. That's the, the class of functions that I want to evaluate. This is my F from the uh, bootstrapping theorem. So if I start with noise, which is an N bit number, my secret key have to be roughly three N square bits. So N square bits gives me degree N, two N square bits give me degree two N, and um, if I have two to the N square terms, then I multiply that by two to the N square, two to the N square, so I get three times, so I, two to the three times N square. Um, should I do, ah, let's do it. Except I don't have, anybody knows where the eraser went? It's on the board. Oh yeah. So look at a single, a single term. So it has, I have x1 times x2 times x. x1 times x2, that's better? x to the... Now I can see the red. 2 n. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll, do the, I'll do the black. So you have one term of degree 2 n. Each one of these has noise which is size 2 to the n. The noise is just multiplied, so that's to the power of 2 n. So that's 2 to the n, to the 2 n squared. So the noise of this one term is two to, of size 2 to the 2n squared. Now I have 2 to the n square of these, so I'm just adding these terms. So the noise is just added, so 2 to the 2n squared, so I'm pretty sure that's 2 to the 3n squared. Yeah, that looks right. Okay. So this is my concrete parameters for the, for the underlying somewhat homomorphic conclusion. Um, but now for the next step, I want the noise to be slightly smaller. Instead of having the evaluated, polyno uh, evaluated ciphertext have a, have a noise of p over two, I want them to have noise of p over two n, okay? So instead of having three n square bits in my p, I need to make my p a little bigger. The noise stays the same. The p gets bigger by how much? By n. I add log n bits. OK, instead of three n square bits, now I have three n squared plus log n. That makes no difference. Uh, all the, the relevant parameters will stay essentially the same. So let's work with primes that are three n squared plus log n bits. If I said prime, I didn't mean it. I meant secret P. Um, and the claim that I'm going to prove on the next slide is that if our evaluated ciphertext have noise less than P over 2N, and the sparse subset that we're using is of size at most N minus 1, strictly smaller than N, then it's enough to keep precision of log N bits for the psi i's. That's what I'm going to show. Uh, by the way, what does it mean enough to keep precision? It means that this number that I'm, ugh, it means that this number that I'm computing would com, will come up the same, I'm going to compute the same number whether I use the high precision version or the low precision version. I'm going to compute the same number. So here's the claim again. I have subset sum of size at most n minus one, and I know that the noise in C is at most p over 2n, which means that c over p is within 1 over 2n of an integer. So it's a number, it's not, it's a rational number, but it's very close to an integer. And I want to prove to you that it's enough to keep log n bits for the psi i's, so let's denote the rounded version of the psi i's, the low precision version of the psi i's by phi i's. So I'm only keeping log n bits of precision, then my error is at most 1 over 2n. 
Uh, if it was truncation, it would be 1 over n, but rounding gives me half that error. So my error is 1 over 2n. So what does that mean when I compare sigma i times phi i with sigma i times psi i? I'm claiming that I can add the sigma i is times the low precision version instead of having the sig adding sigma i is times the high precision versions. So what would I get when I um, add sigma i times phi? Well, if sigma i is a zero, then this number is a zero no matter what. So if sigma i is a zero, I don't change anything. If sigma i is a one, then I introduce a term, an error uh, into the computation, which is at most one over two to the n. So now let's look at the sum. So I'm looking at the sum of the original sum that I needed to compute, and the new sum that I'm claiming is the same. It's going to be the same when I round it to the nearest integer. Uh, so what's the difference between these two? Well, when I, I, I start replacing uh, psi i's with phi i's, and when I do that for terms that correspond to sigma i equals 0, I change nothing. When I do that corresponding to sigma i equal 1, I take this sum and move it away from where it started from by at most 1 over 2 to the n, and I do it at most n minus 1 times. So the distance between these two sums is at most the size of my sparse, sparse subset divided by 2 to the n, which is in this case n minus 1 over 2 n. And remember that I started, the sum that I started from, the high precision version, is very close to an integer. So I started with something very close to an integer, 1 over 2n of the integer, and moved away from it by something which is at most n minus, less than n minus 1 over 2 to the n. So the thing that I end up with is less than a half of the same integer that I started from. So when I round it up, I'm going to get the same answer. Um, so the rounded version, when I take sigma i time phi i and sum it up and round it, or when I take sigma i time psi i and round it up and, and, and sum it up and round it, I'm going to get the same integer. So my new decryption procedure would be take your sigma i's, round them to log n bits of precision, now replace every one with the corresponding sigma and add these low precision numbers. Now, the degree is at most n because the precision is log n, which means that the degree of the multiplied ad addition, this is what we're shooting for. We want the, multiply, the decrypt and multiply function to have degree at most 2n. I said that our uh, encryption now supports degree 2n polynomials. The multiply decryption is degree 2n. If you count the, ner the, the number of terms inside that polynomial, you're definitely not going to get to 2 to the n squared. You're going to get something like 2 to the something linear in n. So definitely the number of terms that we, get, that we allowed is very generous. So our scheme can hand, now we have a bootstrapable scheme. We chose all the parameters so as to get it. Now, it's a fairly large number of parameters to set, but the constraints are not very stringent. So if you want to play with the constraints, there are many constraints that would make this thing work. So it's not like we found the one narrow path of, of setting the constraint that would make it work. Basically, anything reasonable would make it work. This is one set that works. So let's just re recap what we have here. Um, we added to the public key. Oh, sorry. One thing that I promised to get to when I. So why do I need the psi i's to have high precision? Why do I need the di's to have high precision? I, this argument said that this sum, which is equal to c over p, is within 1 over 2n of an integer. But this sum is not equal to c over p, because there is precision error also there. This precision error I need to make small enough so that that thing works. So maybe c over p has to be slightly closer to an integer than c over p. And I want uh, the error that introduced by multiplying by 1 over p, which is not a power of 2. So it cannot, you cannot represent it with finite, with finite precision. I want that error to be small enough so that this is still true. And to do that, the number of bits that the di's have to have is at least the size of, 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 uh, 
of C, it's actually the size of C plus something more than log. Okay. So I added to the public key many rational numbers, DIs, all of them with one bit to the left of the binary point and many, many bits to the right of the binary point. Uh, and they were chosen at random subject to the condition that there exists a very sparse subset of them, in particular subset of size at most n minus 1 that adds up to 1 over p mod 2 with very small rounding error. The new secret key is the characteristic vector of this, sub, of this sparse subset. And I'm also adding to the public key the encryption of this characteristic vector. And now, first of all, I want to say something about security. So clearly, I added a lot of things to the public key. And you should still argue that the, public, the, the encryption scheme remains secure. So you can look at it at what happens when I add the DIs, and then what happens when I additionally add the UIs. So adding the DIs means that now my scheme is going to be um, uh, the hardness of my scheme, the security of my scheme is going to be depending on the hardness of not only the approximate GCD problem, but additional problem, which is the sparse subset sum. The sparse subset sum, think of it as this way. I'm giving you P, and I'm giving you the DI. You tell me what's, what subset I was using in order to, uh, to get that P. This is the sparse subset sum. You have a big set of number. You know that there is a very sparse subset of them that sums up to something, and it doesn't matter. That something could be a zero, it could be a non-zero. You can, you can uh, the, the, the hardness of the problem, the problem remains the same. Um, and you need to give me the, the sparse subset. If that problem is hard, then you can actually use a reduction. Well, in the first part of the reduction, you know P but don't know the sparse subset. In the second part, you don't know either. So you can show that if you have something that breaks the crypto system, when you added these DIs to, this, uh, to the public key, then it either breaks approximate GCD or it breaks the sparse subset sum. The attacks that we have on sparse subset sums are lattice-based attacks. You can do the same type of arguments as to uh, uh, how hard it is. And what you get is that this number T here has to be bigger than square root of the bit length of the, the precision of the, of the Ds that you get. That's essentially what, what happens there. Um, security of RIAs rely on the fact that whatever it is that you got after uh, adding the DIs is still circularly secure. That is, will remain secure also as after you add the UIs. Uh, I just named what I uh, wanted. I didn't give any argument why it should hold. So, and indeed, we have no argument why it should hold, other than the fact that nobody in the world has any idea how to use it in order to compromise security. And as I said, it's, we don't even know that it's not true in general, that every semantically secure uh, bit by bit encryption is also circularly secure. It could be true in general. So if it's true in general, then definitely we're fine. And otherwise, we're just going to pray that this one is, is, is still secure. Um, And with all of that, this is how you compute on, cy on ciphertext. Now you have a, a complete scheme, parameters and all, that I claim can evaluate any arithmetic circuit that you give it. How to multiply two ciphertexts. So both of these ciphertexts could be fresh ciphertext, or maybe they're already evaluated ciphertext. You're somewhere in the middle of your arithmetic circuit, you have ciphertext that were already obtained by evaluation. Uh, but we maintain the environment that the noise is smaller than p over 2n. So what you do is you build the description of mc1c2, this function with these two ciphertext fixed and the secret key as inputs. And you evaluate that function on the fresh encryptions of the secret key uh, in the um, the fresh encryption of the secret key in the, pu in the public key. Uh, I actually described the entire evaluation circuit. I described it as an algorithm, but you can write it as a circuit. It's not going to be low depth because the dynamic programming thing that we use to compute elementary symmetric polynomial is not low depth. Uh, I actually don't know 
if you can evaluate elementary symmetric polynomial of degree 2 to the i in times which is in, in depth it's as logarithmic in i. So it has to be double logarithmic in the degree. I don't think you can do that. Anyway, I'm not sure though. Um, so yeah, so you evaluate this, uh, this uh, polynomial which we have proven is a degree to n. Uh, the result is a new ciphertext still with noise smaller than p over 2n because the degree was small enough and then we can keep computing it. And the same thing for adding and now we can add and we can multiply then we can evaluate any binary circuit. What does n need to be? Uh, n well, n is, a, n is a security parameter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You need, no, n is your security parameter, n is your 80 or something. Your wish? n is your 80 or something like that. That's 2 to the minus n? The, the security that you get is exponential in n, yeah. Mm -hmm. not, it's not, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's 2 to the minus n, yes. 2 to the minus n? Yeah, 2 to the minus n. And the, 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 the O term comes when you talk about the length of things. So the, specifically the size of the multipliers um, yeah, I guess n to the fifth would work, actually. It would give you 2 to the minus n, now, I think. Um, there's one more thing that I want to talk about, and I haven't mentioned it so far, so um, I'll spend uh, one slide on it. There is the question of what is the distribution of the evaluated ciphertexts? And there are applications where you would like evaluated ciphertexts to have the same distribution as fresh ciphertexts. Um, didn't think of coming up with an example of that, but... Uh, Can you prove if I uh, computed something and then gave you back the result? Good, yeah, yeah, computer? right. If, if you want to prove that I, I encrypted something and sent it to you that I needed, did this complicated computation on encrypted data and gave me back the result, I want to claim that I don't learn anything about you this function other than the output that it gave me. How I'm going to prove it? An easy way of proving it would be to say that the distribution of evaluated ciphertext is the same as the distribution of fresh encryptions of the same bits. In which case, all I've seen is a random ciphertext encrypting the right thing. Okay? So, so you need to condition on the secret key. Right? Yeah, I know the secret key, right. But in this case, it's, it's a statistical thing, so it's, it's actually statistically close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also, you need that if you want to compute another evaluation on that, right? Uh, here, I don't. Here, the, the only condition that I need is that the noise in the evaluated ciphertext is small enough. This well, is, this is the. You said you need fresh. In that, the freshly encrypted ones are the ones that are fixed in the public key. This is just the encryption of the secret key. This is the only thing that I need to be fresh. Um, but yeah, it has to. So Yuval is right. It has to be the same distribution, even conditioned on the uh, secret key. And you know, well, depending if you're in a semi-honest or in a malicious case, you may want to argue it for every secret key or just for for every public key or just for public key that was generated honestly. This thing only gives it for public key that generated honestly, this technique that I'm using here. Um, but we all know that we can apply the GMW compiler to it if you ever need it in a <laughs> protocol. So, um, so how do I do that? So there are two terms to the ciphertext. There is the, the multipliers and the noise. The multipliers is not a problem. The multipliers you can put a whole bunch of uh, encryptions of zero in the public key, and then at the end of your computation, add a, uh, a subset sum of those encryptions of zero. And the same argument that I used in my proof of the approximate GCD reduction, um, the multiplier thing would be randomized this, by, by this. The noise is a little harder to, to deal with, and we essentially just take a brute force approach here. Um, let's make our p slightly bigger than what we said so far. So, so far to evaluate every function, my p was 3n squared plus log n bits. Let's make it 3n squared plus n plus log n bits, okay? 
So now my noise of evaluated ciphertexts, after I'm finished doing this uh, multiply decryption, is not going to be p, p over 2 to the p over 2n, but rather p over 2 to the n. Because p is now by 2 to the n big, uh, factor bigger. Um, so now what I'm going to do is just going to add a noise, a new freshly chosen noise of size p over 2 to the n to that. So I'm going to add it after I encrypt a new bit. So I'm getting a bit with encryption, a uh, bit with noise p over 2n. And I'm going to add it after I evaluate. So I get an evaluated ciphertext whose noise is whatever it was before, something of size p, to the two, p over 2 to the n, plus p over 2n. So again, the p over 2n term drowns out the noise that was there before. So the, the distribution over the noise is statistically close to what it is in the fresh ciphertext. The distribution of multipliers is statistically close to what it was in the uh, uh, fresh ciphertext. The only thing to note is that you really shouldn't add that extra noise to the bits of the secret key that are included in the public key. Those have to be freshly encrypted bits from the original version. But, you know, that's part of the public key. We don't care about the distribution of that. So uh, this is how you handle ciphertext distribution. And with that, now you have a scheme that can evaluate every arithmetic circuit that you give it, and that the distribution of freshly encrypted bits is statistically close to the distribution of evaluated bits as long as this, the public key was generated honestly. Um, and that's sort of... Why should I applications and uh, you, want, you want two rounds, so you can't even, in theory, apply a geodot. Yeah, you need to use NISX, right? Oh, you need to, you actually, that's not enough either. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm not sure I know how to solve that problem. Uh, if, you, if you can't use interaction, even in a pre-processing step, and you want to handle maliciously chosen public key, I don't know if the statement that the public key is good in that respect, meaning the public key works as a, with the leftover hash lemma, is an NP statement that you can actually prove. If it is, then, then things are easy. You can use NISX. Otherwise, it's what about in hmm? in Same thing. It's uh... OK. I have eight more minutes, which is great, because I need two of them to do the conclusions. Um, so we constructed a fully homomorphic public key encryption scheme uh, the underlying somewhat homomorphic encryption relies on the hardness of approximate GCD. The resulting scheme relies also on the hardness of sparse subset sum and circular security. Uh, the ciphertext size, the ciphertext size is the same as it was in the original scheme. The post-processing is something that you do as part of the your eval procedure. So when you send ciphertext, all you need to, to send are the original ciphertext, which are only n to the fifth bits long. How much is 80 to the power 5? <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, yeah. Right, so the public key is polynomial of somewhat high degree uh, in your security parameter. So uh, yeah, that doesn't quite fit with the efficient uh, part of the title of the winter school, but it is useful for uh, secure computation, so I think I'm... Um, that's it. So this is the scheme that I described is the second fully homomorphic encryption that was uh, proposed. The first one is gent uh, Gentry's scheme that is based on ID lattices. The math underlying the somewhat homomorphic encryption is a little more complex, but those you can come up with variants 
where the size of the public key is something like n to the power of 2.5 or 3.5, I forget. But we actually implemented it. That we actually had an implementation on even with parameters that we feel fairly comfortable with, the size of the public key is no more than like three gigabytes or something. <laughs> so it's really something uh, we can use today for, uh, and computing a single gate take somewhere between three minutes and 30 minutes. So, uh, Right, so these schemes are sort of as non, as non, non malleable as you can possibly uh, uh, expect because you can take any ciphertext and maul it into any ciphertext in, of any other thing. Now, if you want, um, yeah, this one is clearly not going to be secure because I can always take the encryption of the secret key bits that sit in the public key and ask you to decrypt them. Um, <laughs> yeah, but in, in general, the, the, and the general answer is I don't know. Uh, schemes that rely on circular security, sort of, you, 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 it seems that you. Right, so yeah, you can do, uh, so if you know how many times you're gonna need to do this refreshing, this recrypt operation, then you can put in the public key, uh, not encryption of the secret key of that scheme, but rather encryption of the secret key of level zero with the public key of level one and the secret key of level one with the public key of level two. And if you have a bound on the number of times you need to do that, so for, uh, if, you, if you have a bound on the depth of the circuit that you're going to evaluate, then you can do things this way. Um, yeah. For many applications, that's fine. Yeah, for, yes. Application, that's yeah. Uh, names, I don't know. I mean, uh, in Gentry's paper, this is referred to as a leveled encryption, uh, isomorphic encryption or something. I don't know. I don't, I don't know about, uh, maybe other uh, groups call it by other names. Yeah. 